do the, the honors you belong or were you what do you mean? Together with Jan uh, or are you presentation? Or the presentation? Uh, oh maybe jump in and talk. Yeah, 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 we can do that too. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Well, if we are on camera then we should also officially announce uh, the start of your presentation. Do you want to put it live? Okay, well, welcome everyone to the CorpNet seminar. Uh, we are here for a presentation by uh, Milan Babic, who is a PhD student, and Jan Fischner, who is a uh, postdoc in our group, and also Ilka Heemskijk, who is not present, but an author of the paper. So, Milan, uh, take us away on states versus corporations. Yeah, uh, yeah thanks. Um, so. I'm going to present this paper we wrote in the last uh, months, weeks, I don't know. And uh, I think we talked more about it than we actually worked on it. <laughs> but um, I think it's nevertheless nice in the end. Um, so basically, uh, the paper is about a, a simple idea, actually. But uh, we tried to, or uh, an old idea, more or less. But we try to uh, rethink it a little bit from the angle of what people here are doing. Uh, and the problem is uh, the role of corporate power in IR. And I will explain it a little bit why it's an old problem. Um, then I will talk a little bit about uh, two positions that are yeah, taking position in this, uh, in this problem of corporate power in IR. And then I will tell you why we think that this is this needs to be bridged or to be rethought in a um, in a way that makes sense for uh, empirical research. And <laughs> yeah, and then we I will just maybe I won't really talk about this uh, example because you all probably know it, or I will just briefly mention it, uh, maybe for Walter, uh, who probably doesn't know the stuff on state ownership. Uh, but it's just an example, so it's more of a conceptual paper, I would say. Uh, okay, this is Susan Strange, and <coughs> for those of you who don't know her, uh, she's yeah, one of the big five or big seven IR scholars of the 20th century, basically, and the only woman, of course, um, uh, or unfortunately. And um, in 91, or in the, in, yeah, so she, she wrote in the 80s, or 70s, 80s, 90s, and in 91, um, she, yeah, she had this kind of paper or, or call, basically, where she stated that, or in more than one paper, but in, in one it was very explicit, where she said that, yeah, well, if you look at how, uh, at the state of IR, so of international relations, the discipline that thinks about international politics, um, as such, um, and she compared them to flat, to, to flat earthers in Galileo's time, so she said that, uh, those are people who talk about power and think about power and what is power and who holds it, which is the core question of IR in the international system, but they're constantly ignoring the multinational corporation, which is gaining more and more power, especially in her time. So in the, if you think about uh, globalization and everything, this started to accelerate in the 80s. Uh, she was right back then, and she's probably right even more today. Um, so that's one part of the problem that IR scholars constantly ignored this basic or constantly ignore to incorporate corporate power in their research agenda. They of course talked about it. So if you think of um, people like Naomi Klein, she's not really a res uh, scholar, IR scholar in that sense, but um, she wrote a famous book in the end of the 90s, I think, No Logo, maybe you heard of it, which uh, yeah was about corporate power basically. Uh, or if you think about this um, 2011 paper from uh, these Zurich guys, Vitalia and Batistão and, and James Flatfelder, mm, you see that people are actually interested in, in that kind of, yeah, the, the power of the corporation, the, co the power of multinational corporations, but that's, we call it in the paper piecemeal work, because it only, so it, it comes from my perspective, uh, from a, maybe more moral dissatisfaction with what how corporate uh, how big corporations behave in the international environment and then they either write a book on it or make the study and say look 
how, how, how powerful corporations are and what they are doing and we need to talk about it. But there's no systematic research agenda that would I incorporate that into IR because IR is the, how do you say that, the, the, the program or the, the research uh, discipline within political science that should talk about that basically. And um, so you don't really have that? Uh, uh, you don't really have that in IR. Also, if you look at people like Robert Cohen, who writes in 2009, oh, uh, we should think about corporate power in the future as a like uh, research uh, point. And um, so what we do now is then say, okay, well, we, we should somehow try to integrate it um, and look at how IR or international political economy thinks about these things in general. And then we describe two positions which are very broad so I think that within these positions there are a lot of other uh, more nuanced positions, but for the sake of the argument, um, we say that you have on the one hand these state centrists like uh, went on and Jilpin who wrote in the 70s and 80s, also, yeah, probably who were friends with Susan Strange, I guess, and whom she also criticized a little bit indirectly because they said, okay, well, we, we have this phenomenon of, of multinational corporations, uh, what do we do with it? Well, okay, we live in a state-centric world, there are states, and there are these multinationals, and we can explain them by uh, looking at how states behave towards them, or how they influence the behavior between states. So, what you see from this perspective is that you have uh, a lot of big and powerful states, and then you have, for example, maybe here, if you look at this C1, so S is always state, and C is corporation. If you look at corporation one, it's maybe a so-called national champion from state one, that state one tries to um, internationalize maybe in a sense and to enhance state one's power position in the international environment via this national champion. Or you could say that um, here cooperation two influences in some way the, the relations between state one and state two, but um, in general corporations are not really seen as, as equal actors, but more as influencing the relations between these uh, actors that actually make up the international environment. But as was already the case in, uh, in the time when Strange wrote, this is not really, this doesn't really fit with reality. Because if you look at um, the, that's, and that's one example, or that's maybe the main driver of, of corporate internationalization, at uh, global M&As, you see that from the 80s to today, you have a, yeah, how do you say that, a constant rise of, or um, uh, a significant rise of uh, M&As and especially of cross-border M&As. Sorry, what is it M&A? Merger and acquisition, so okay. the, the, mm -hmm. the merging or the, yeah, yeah. of firms so that they become um, bigger basically and cross-border of course that they transnationalize in that sense. So what you see here is that already in, in the time when these people wrote about the multinational corporation, the corporation was already much more than just uh, a, a side phenomenon, but it was already gaining size and power in the international environment, and that wasn't really reflected in this state-centric approach. <coughs> and that's just one, one of the figures, but you could also look at FDI levels or whatever, or at case studies which can show you that. So. Um, so then you had in the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, you had people who thought more critically about this uh, development and they said, well, um, if you look at how, how, global, how the global order is made up, it's basically, uh, we, we entered a phase of transnational capitalism and you can't really say that we live in this state-centric world anymore, but you rather live in a world that is um, structured by the behavior of capital around the world. So you have this very uh, agile and, and mobile capital fractions that shape the world um, according to their interests and there is not really something, a state power that could be set against that, something like that, along these lines. And we call this position, which is also very broad or very rough, but we call it a transnational capitalism position. And there are people like uh, William Robinson, uh, also Bastian uh, van Aperdorn from the VU and other people who really theorize about that and of course it's, they are from 
yeah, critical IP mainly, but you also have other people, Christopher May, for example, who look at it from a network perspective and say that, okay, well, if you look how corporations behave in, in global governance, you can't really say that they are uh, subject to, to the rules of, of the old state-centric world, but that they do basically whatever they want, and they transcended this, this fear of, of state-centric capitalism. And what you see here is that, of course, they they dictate basically the, the rules of the game and influenced by that the behavior of states. And yeah, you yeah do you have any uh, particular uh, semantics or, or meaning behind? Yeah, we, we have that in the paper. So, for example, if you if you see it, uh, this kind of um, arrow means that um, you have a direct power position, so that um, Corporation One can exercise directly power towards. Uh, state one, and this means that they are um, that they are uh, how to say that tied together, so that you have a kind of coalition here between these states, but that they can't really do anything. And for example, that state one and state three don't like each other, so they are opposed. So we have this in the paper. It's about free. You can have three modes of relations, which are cooperative, conflictive, and neutral. And that's what what these things depict. So that, that's a more a cooperative thing. And this dashed line is more a, a neutral relation and so on. So the, the basic point is that um, that corporate power trumps state power in any case. And it doesn't really matter what states do. And so that's this position more or less. Yeah. OK. Um, so then we say, yeah, well, but if you look at, um, for example, uh, who's the, so this transnational capitalism perspective also looks at, at the world from basically from U.S. hegemony and how U.S. transnational capital r rules the world, basically. But already in there, if you, if you think about U.S. <laughs> hegemony, you, you think about hegemony that is exercised by a nation state. So there are also contradictions with, within the position because also if you look at the main opposition to U.S. hegemony, it's, it's always China. It's not, uh, you know, I don't know, some Chinese multinational or whatever, but, but a state. And so this position is also not really consistent with what's going on in the world, but at least it takes into account that we live in a world of transnationally organized capitalism. So then what we say in the paper is, okay, if you have these phenomena, so you have on the one hand corporate power, but you also have states that somehow transform and somehow survived globalization as nation states, they didn't disappear. How can you think about it conceptually and how can you use these, these this framework to actually do research on that. Because what is also a really big point in, in classical IR is that they don't really do empirical, um, how do you say that, uh, good empirical research in the sense that you really try to understand who holds power in the international system, but rather look at conceptions of power that you already have and then look what's going on in the world and then search for your cases that you think that fit your um, narrative, basically. So then we say, OK, how can you think about this in a meaningful way? And we have three theoretical points and one methodological or conceptual point. And the three theoretical points are that um, we look at the, at the world of international relations or international politics uh, in a realistic sense. So this ik is very important. <laughs> which means that we take over these realist assumptions about how hegemony functions in the international order, that power matters and not, you know, I don't know, cooperation or, or some other things. But that we live in a, in a realist world, but we make it more realistic by saying, OK, the agents or the actors that exercise power within this game are not states by default. So it, it can also be corporations. It could also be some other organization. But what we need to look at is, who actually exercises power and not who we think exercises power and then just look at these um, actors. So that's this realistic in, uh, that we add to this approach. And um, in empirical terms, this means just framing both states and corporations as actors within global capitalism, which maybe sounds trivial, but it actually isn't. Because if you look at the, at a great deal of IP and IR literature, you often have um, state power I theorized about and not uh, corporate power. The second point is this juxt what we call juxtaposition, which is a really cool word I never heard about before. <laughs> but we found it because we now what we wanted to say here is actually that 
we, we look at states and corporations in the international system not as um, subjected one to another, so we don't say, like the state centers say, okay, state power counts and corporate power not, and we also don't agree with this transnational capitalism literature that says, okay, it's all about corporate power and all we need to do is look at how class fractions behave and, and what they do and what states do doesn't really matter. But we want to say that they're somehow equal, but not the same. So you get it? It's, it's a little bit, it's tricky to, to describe it in one word. And then we came up with this juxtaposition, which just means that they're basically on the same level or the same playing field or something like that, which doesn't mean that they are equal in any other sense. So of course, states are uh, dense social relations that are totally different from corporations. They have different um, aims, different objectives, different organizational principles. But as actors in global capitalism, they are juxtaposed in our sense, in the way we mean it. And um, so then the global environment or the international political economy is an agency space for different actors, in this case co states and corporations, that are not per se different in their abilities to exercise power. So that's um, important. And in empirical terms this means that uh, you can use this bottom-up data-driven approach so that you don't assume that predetermined power capacities are important, but that you look at, okay, who actually holds power in the international system. And then the, the third point is this actor and relations focus, which just means that you don't look at, at positional power, so at, for example, the US and its military capacity and, and its financial capacities and so on, but you look rather at relations that um, emerge from this global power play, so you look at relations which is then translated into a network approach. So that's one addendum that is actually very important, but uh, yeah, so you have to do that in, in empirical terms, otherwise it doesn't really make uh, make sense. Because there are also a lot of people talking about networks in IR, but yeah, they don't fill it with, um, yeah, how do you say that, with research. Okay, so, uh, Okay, then that's our position, which is also, yeah, sh it shouldn't confuse you, it's just the, um, the idea that um, if you look at corporations, you should look at them as somehow juxtaposed, and so they relate differently to states and to other corporations in the international environment, and we can't really say who's, who's winning and who's losing until we look at uh, what is concretely going on. And to not make it too uh, theoretical, we include we actually included two empirical examples, which was this offshore stuff um, that you guys did, and this SOEs, and then of course the editor said, oh, it's too much, and we don't understand it, and so on, blah, blah. Anyway, uh, so we kicked out the offshore stuff and uh, left that, and uh, that's just one example of how you could think about that um, in, in concrete terms. So this is the as you might all know, the, the global network of uh, state-owned enterprises that are owned by states by more than 50.01%. And uh, they, of course, build a network. So if you think that uh, China owns a um, company somewhere in France or something, then uh, there's a tie created between China and France. So everybody gets it. It's actually a simple idea. And the reason why we took that, I will explain this picture, um, in a second. The reason why we took that is that we don't think of uh, transnational state ownership as states owning something in another state, but states owning companies that then create transnational ties. So you have two actors in the game, basically, that are somehow dependent on each other because states couldn't just, you could also say, okay, why? Uh, if it's about power, China could send, I don't know, military to France or something and then uh, create these ties. But actually what they do is they, um, they set up a corporation or, they, or a corporation um, decides to transnationalize, but the corporation, the management, and the, the people running the corporation need to decide on, uh, on doing that. Maybe less in the case of China because it's more uh, party dominated in that sense. But um, in others, for example, France is also a very big owner. You have a very close um, 
mutual interdependence basically between state and corporation, so as, as two different actors. And the other hand also, if a Chinese corporation goes to uh, France or to South America or whatever, it is always, and it's really always, if you look at the financial literature and financial times or whatever, it's always perceived as somehow fishy. So it's always a different thing if a state-owned company goes somewhere and uh, um, a normal company, so to speak, or a, a private company. So there you already create, especially in the case of like more authoritar authoritarian regimes like uh, China, uh, you create tensions that could have potential uh, or, or have the potential to uh, have some power outcomes or possibilities to change the relation between state. And we don't really go into that in that paper. We don't say, okay, if China owns something in France, and this means that China is, has a leverage or power position um, about over France in, in, in a geopolitical sense or something, you just say, okay, we need to determine that in case studies, but actually this already shows that, also how people react, that this isn't trivial. It's not about that, it's not a purely financial transaction if, if a Chinese or uh, some other uh, state does this, this transnationalization, transnationalization of state ownership. Okay, and yeah, for the rest, the communities are, uh, uh, modularity maximization uh, communities and yeah I mean if you have questions we can talk about it but you can also find it in the paper and then we just draw some like minor uh, conclusions from that so for example that Chinese state ownership is very spread um, as opposed for example to, to German or to this North uh, European um, state ownership community that is very uh, close together and so on. And we did also the same for Indigree, so who is owned, which is also, uh, which you should put always in quotation marks because you don't talk actually about states that are owned. And um, yeah, another thing is we counted uh, the transnational corporations as, so one corporation is one tile, we didn't do it with revenue in that case. Okay. Right, so the weight is in count. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so the, the weight, so if you see that, uh, in that case, UK is very big, means that they receive a lot of, uh, co or host a lot of state-owned companies, basically. Um, okay, so conclusions is, um, first we think that we relate to strange call for, uh, for a more realistic, uh -huh. or how we frame it, more realistic IPE, uh, by f really thinking about, okay, who actually, uh, what is power first? which is maybe a point for another paper, but especially who holds power in the international system. And I think that our example also shows, in a sense, that um, this isn't always as obvious as a lot of people think, and that we should really think about these things. And another point is uh, to take home is that um, we all have these, uh, we can do that because we have these technological and methodological uh, advances as opposed to people 25 years ago. But on the other hand, this doesn't mean that, okay, now that we have it, we can talk about it. Because if you think, at, um, think of uh, Klein or of these Vitalia and, at, uh, and the other people from Zurich, what they actually do is they make a good point and they maybe have, uh, especially the, the Zurich people, they have a very... Um, uh, fine-grained and, and methodologically and empirically very good way of, of doing that. But it's actually not theory-based. So if you think about it, it's, it's in a sense stands for itself and doesn't really tell you much about how the world actually works because it focuses on one part of this state, corporations and maybe other actors in the international environment. So what we need to do is, I think, to uh, use these methods and everything, but always to reflect it back on how people actually think about the world. Because I think a majority of the people who is interested in, in global power, they don't think along these lines. They think along the, the classical IR or IPE lines. And yeah. So, and yeah, not, and the last point maybe is that um, what we did here maybe also be like a starting point for this power paper we want to write for ISA. Um, because I think that we will probably talk about corporate power, or that's the subject of the paper. And maybe this is a good uh, yeah, opener for that. Yeah. OK. I think that's it. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Thanks.
questions or comments? Perhaps even from our guests. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, I have to admit that I didn't read the whole paper and I don't know nearly as much as I should about this. Mm -hmm. But uh, my question is, so you, you use the word juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. And you also, the title of the, of the paper is States versus Corporations, so both things imply that there's a conflict or that they are, well, they are juxtaposed, mm -hmm. which means they are perhaps competing for the same thing or they are, yeah, there's a conflict there. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could expand on that. Why, why do you think that that is the case? Are they, are they in competition with one another? Is there a conflict there? Why couldn't you say, oh, the, would they all get along fine? So, so what is your view on, on the, the relation? Um, Maybe I can chip in there as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, because um, actually in this paper, you only have one side of our argument, how states use corporations to, to further their interests. We also had the, the other way, the yeah. other side of the coin, um, how corporations use states to advance their interest, namely to reduce their global tax payments. So, and I think ultimately you have to, you have to think both ways. So in, in offshore finance, um, corporations use offshore jurisdictions. Actually, in some, some examples, they, they write or they draft the laws for the, for the jurisdictions, for the sovereign jurisdictions um, in order to, to uh, reduce their, their tax rates. So this is kind of both ways we, we think about it. Yeah. And um, another point maybe to add is that um, we take over this realist assumption about how the, how the international environment functions, which is also not really theoretically reflected or something in the paper. We just take it over. But I think that you have a good point and that you also have the, the other side of, of how the world functions. And maybe offshore is, is a good example for that, but you also have more obvious things so that states really cooperate in a sense with corporations or with other actors like NGOs or something to, uh, so from this liberal perspective to improve things in the world or something like that, or that they align interests or something. That's what we try to, to depict in these uh, uh, pictures we had in the, um, in the paper. Uh, but w what we are interested in is, is in that sense like power, like who has power, who, what is power and who holds it? So that's a strange question, that's what we focus on, but you're right that of course it's never just this side. Yeah. Following up a little bit on this, uh, so I see that, well one, one way of talking, you, you already say that like hopefully they are all working towards the same uh, sort of making the world better kind of idea, but I would say that uh, Primarily, they have, uh, well, not perhaps competing, but, but clearly different interests. So sort of their main interest, their main goal for, for existing uh, or for you know, being there is definitely different, namely uh, profit uh, versus being a good institution, being mm -hmm. a good host to your citizens. I don't know, so something like that. So the state has clearly different goals. And I think that's also by juxtaposition with what was it meant, right? right? So you're competing for the same, um, you're not necessarily competing, but you're both equivalent in terms of what you're, at what level you're trying to grasp something. I mm -hmm. think that's roughly what the term means. Uh, yeah. In a different way. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, so in terms of like, I mean, if I see the, the, the main point of the paper, it's sort of bringing those well, seeing the short shortcomings of those both state-based or transnational capital-based theories and go something in between where states and, and, act and uh, uh, corporations can be regarded independently and influencing each other in different ways. But my question is mainly like, uh, maybe the biggest problem with uh, those two perspectives, the transnational capitalism and the state-based uh, 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 perspective, is that you try to capture the whole world of capitalism, contemporary capitalism, in either one of those perspectives. Whereas in some places, in some cases, the one perspective does better at explaining mm. what's going on and, and in another case, instance, the other perspective. Mm. So if you now bring in your third perspective, to what extent does it allow for 
um, after taking all into account and I mean is this an attempt to establish a new third perspective that that does better uh, uh, than the other ones because I think maybe we shouldn't attempt to capture all of contemporary capitalism mm -hmm. into one perspective either how I do it or whatever it may be because in, 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 in some uh, places like you really do see the state based like corporations lobby the state to advance their interests mm -hmm. through a state way and in other instances it's, it's the other way around so yeah, that's true. So I think it's a good point and uh, maybe yeah, we should have made it clearer that we don't actually um, or I don't know if Jan agrees but we don't really develop an, a theory kind of thing mm -hmm. but um, we try to say okay if, if you have these, these, these grand theories or, or pers it's more perspectives because they're not actually a theory we, we, we frame them as, as perspectives and you can't really explain what's going on and that's actually your, your, what you were saying in the end right so if you look at, at, at the specifics of global capitalism you can't really understand them for example if you look from transnational from transnational capitalism perspective because there everything would be determined by the interest of, of transnationally organized capital and what we say is but if if you look close enough you can see that even states that are always perceived as as the losers in that game they also sometimes prevail and they also have power resources that allow them to play the game of global capitalism of transnational capitalism and i think that's a little bit not uh, what we try to do is not to to put another perspective or a third or fourth or whatever perspective in, into that, but to nuance it a little bit and, mm -hmm. and to bridge it. I think yeah. we also say we, we try yeah. to bridge it. Yeah. And in that sense, yeah, so but maybe this could have been a little bit more clear because we also say, okay, we have this nice picture of, of this state center view, of this transnational capitalism view, and that's our view. But yeah, so, yeah, but you're right. And I think that's also what, what we wanted to uh, look at actually. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So I get lost a bit in these different types of actors that you are operating with. On the one hand you say that you have like states and corporations mm. and they are together doing something. But then like your like all these network pictures they are still about states, but then you try to say that it's Still, like they are related with the corporation and such mm -hmm. a relation between states, and um, and um, for me, it's I don't know. It looks almost impossible, and it's difficult to think about how can you analyze both of them together mm -hmm. uh, empirically. Do you have some ideas about it? Uh, so what what we are looking here at, for example, that's not at states. So it's of course, I, I mean we. Right. Yeah, because so, I mean, yeah, I get it. so it's states connected to different owners. Uh, they are connected if they own like some companies. Yeah. So, yeah, that's okay. too. Okay. Okay. We did so it in this network. Of, okay. Yeah, but it's. You, I think you're thinking uh, too, too too networky or something. They're not really connect. So they create a tie, of course, if they if they own a, a company in another country, but this is. Um, how they say that, like multi-dimensional in a way, because of course it's it's the, the state appears here as an owner and not as a nation state or something, but a state has only a connection to another because it's it's an owner because he takes place in global capitalism, and but he couldn't do that without the corporation. So there you have this. Of course you don't see it here because it's only one dimension, but uh, what's going on there is that you you need both kinds of actors to realize that what's happening here. And that was the point, I think. But states are, the, the corporations are still subordinate, you could say. States are controlling. Basically. Yeah, they, they are, sub, so that's what Jan tried to say yeah. before, because yeah, the, in that case, yes, but even there, they are subordinate, so from an ownership perspective, but not from the perspective that they actually, they need to, for example, to perform. You can't have a, you can't just plant a company or Maybe people think that actually the China can do that or something, but you can't just plant a company in another uh, place and say, okay, that's what we wanted. But they need to, uh, they need the management to, to agree on that, and they need to uh, to actually perform and to fulfill that. So there is a mutual interdependency in that case. So that's, yeah. But of course, that was rather an uh, example of how states 
try to use corporations and the, the offer stuff would be the other way around. But of course you don't see that here uh, just from the, from the picture. Yeah, I think basically our aim with the paper is to, as you said before, to bridge both perspectives mm -hmm. and to open the field for, for other research that is kind of you know, in between. Um, I think there are a lot of other perspectives you can, you can study this. Um, for example, um, increasing not state ownership by a private ownership from in country A to country B. Mm. So in the 80s and 90s, most of the, the corporate ownership was you know, nationally uh, dominated, nationally contained. Now it's internationalizing. And this also, of course, has repercussions for the national political economy. Institutions can change. And, and there are also, uh, I think, multiple ways in which corporations then indirectly can, can influence states. Mm. Yeah, but uh, the other response uh, also good that we should make it clearer with uh, how we want to distinguish that uh, these different types of actors and activities. Because as I understood, you want to analyze them as different types of actors, but still, I, I guess it's still the impression that it's still about mostly states, no? Yeah, yeah with the yeah. state ownership example, yeah. But maybe we can uh, make it clearer. Yeah, thanks. Great. More questions or comments? No. Then perhaps uh, we should uh, close our session and uh, once again thank our uh, two contributors for this evening, Milan.